Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our sponsors, Four Paws International and other patents. Um, I have an important announcement before we go ahead with the housekeeping issues and then the presentation itself. Uh, there is an email in your inbox uh, with the title important update for JATMC delegates. It appears that the Sydney uh, schedule uh, time zone <clears throat> had a, a glitch that was corrected recently. It's a four hour glitch, especially if you're interested in listening to your colleagues in New Zealand. So uh, I we urge you or invite you to go to our website and check on the agenda there uh, that is reviewed and, and updated. So again, the uh, the title of the email is important update for GADMC delegates. Um, a few housekeeping bits. Uh, the Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So if you have any questions, please use the, the questions and answer feature and we will endeavor to answer them. Uh, please do it uh, quickly, not at the end of the conversation because we tend to run out of time. This year we have enabled multilingual closed captions. So if you would like to hear the presentation in other languages, click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I encourage you to use the hashtag JADMCConf for Twitter and other social media. A short evaluation will be made available when you exit the session. And just as a reminder, the video of this, the video recording of this presentation will be available later this year after it's been edited. Now, um, Ms. Erica Honey, or Mrs. Erica Honey is the principal consultant at Erica Honey Consulting from Australia. And she will be talking, the, the title of her presentation is Noah's Ark Disaster Triage. The floor is yours, Ms. Honey. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for being here. Uh, it is a uh, good morning to be presenting and talking with you. So um, firstly, uh, Kaya, uh, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Wujak Noongar Budja lands on which I present today, and I pay my deepest respects to the elders past and present. I also extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islanders and First Nations people here today, welcome. In 2005, early 2005, I headed to uh, Thailand uh, to assist with the efforts in the Boxing Day tsunami. And we waited for 115 cats to be delivered from uh, Pipi Island. It's a uh, little island with a lot of cats, uh, some dogs as well. And we waited for the Thai military to deliver us these cats that had been on this devastated island by the tsunami. The cats that we had uh, were a mix, mix of ages. Some were kittens, little babies, some were older. We had males, females, sterilized, unsterilized. Some were owned, some were. Because of the resource limitations, we had to put, well, they had to put four to six to a cage. The animals had the sorts of conditions that you would expect from floodwaters from a tsunami. They had swollen feet from standing in the waters for too long. They had gastrointestinal issues from drinking the dirty water and unfortunately and sadly also from eating bodies. They also had lacerations, the kinds of trauma that you expect to see, and of course um, some fight wounds, unfortunately, because of the way that they had to be transported to get to safety in Bangkok. So we assessed all of these animals, uh, the crates were stacked high out there in the humidity and we decided we needed to put the quarantined animals outside because we had a, a house with nothing in it with three levels. And so what we did was we triaged the remaining animals into three levels and we put them into each level of that house. They then got their medications, fluids, some of the healthier ones just got water and food. Um, and the whole, um, the whole experience, we had about a team of 12 people, sometimes more, sometimes less, with one translator for a team that spoke mostly Thai. Had a lot of complexities with that response. Uh, we had press, we had the TV uh, people, we had uh, radio, uh, a lot of interruptions, very long days. Fatigue management was very difficult. Um, I did two weeks straight of 16 hour days as an average. Uh, and we had some other complexities as well with some cultural differences, language differences, of course, and then some really ethically challenging situations where 
Sadly, we would have uh, some of the owners who had made it alive through the tsunami actually coming up to Bangkok to search for uh, loved ones, and those loved ones included their cats as well. So we had one really nice uh, re, uh, re, re, reuniting, which was fantastic. Um, but yeah, the, the whole situation was incredibly complex. And so there were some big lessons learned for me from that. And one of them was that we must have uh, animals uh, planned for in emergencies in an official capacity, and we almost... Uh, we also, I should say, must have our veterinary teams trained to do triage, very important. So let's have a little bit more of a background about animals in disasters and why we need to know this from a triage capacity. So in Australia, we know that many animals and their owners are going to be affected by emergencies. We have an increase in severity and frequency, and this overwhelms a community's normal functions. So in Australia, mostly wildlife and livestock are often most affected, and then we have companion animals and horses following that. But this can change depending on the population of the people, the animals, the preparedness, the type of disaster that we're seeing. And we know that underpinning everything is this human-animal bond. So we take a one health and one welfare approach, and we know that what we do with one group will usually affect the other. So therefore, we consider animals through all aspects um, of emergency management, all phases, and all hazards as well. We know that a resilient community understands that animals are a key component of recovery. And this is what our vet, vet triage teams help with. So let's begin with emergency management legislation and why it matters that animals are in it. So in Australia, we are still developing in this area and we've got a long way to go. When animals in legislation, it enables us to respond officially, effectively and safely. It also helps the One Health and One Welfare principles as well. So in Australia, from a strategic point of view, we actually have the renewed Australian Animal Welfare Strategy. We're very excited to see what that will bring us because last time in 2014, uh, they did a lot of animal emergency management. So we uh, look forward to see, see what that will bring. We also have our national planning principles for animals and disasters. These were designed and finalised in 2012. This uh, lets us know exactly what we should be planning for at the state level, uh, local and regional levels as well. Emergency animal disease is probably the only uh, situation where we have national planning for animals in place, and that is with a formalised agreed plan. Uh, then from a state perspective, that is carried out logistically and of course managed operationally. Most of our emergency management in Australia is carried out at the state level. And so these are emergency management acts uh, that give a legislative responsibility to our hazard management agencies. Where do our animal plans fit? They fit in underneath as a support agency with a combat role or a support role in underneath those state level plans. And so they fulfill that incident command system when they're going in, uh, answering to our hazard management agency. Our veterinary personnel are no strangers to legislation and codes of practice. We work with them every single day. But what's different for us is that when we deploy and we go to a different area, we can have some differences in the rules and how we conduct ourselves. And so we must be working with experienced personnel so that we can understand exactly what we should be doing in that scenario. Local knowledge is so important. And when it comes to registration, our veterinarians must be registered to work in each state or territory in Australia. Our veterinary boards are very good at making sure that people meet the criteria and getting them through quickly for deployment. But for our veterinary nurses, it's only Western Australia where our nurses have to be registered. And so I recommend that all nurses across Australia, including um, WA, are signed up to our AVNAT registration scheme, which is currently an informal scheme, and we hope that that will become formal in time. That is run through our Veterinary Nursing Council of Australia. So let's move on to disaster triage now and have a think about what it actually means to us as veterinary teams. So the whole aim in what we're doing is to sort the animals according to their medical urgency. That's the simple definition. It actually gets a lot more complex than that because of the many varied species that we're looking after and all of the options to triage. So we have systems, we have scenarios, and then we have species specific information that we need to follow. So it's very utilitarian and we have to make some tough decisions at some points. We need to save as many animals as we can. 
We have to be efficient because resources can sometimes be quite tight, meaning we don't have a lot. And generally, generally the role will be fulfilled by a veterinary nurses. Having said that, there's situations where there's higher risk, including euthanasia decisions as well. So there's some legalities around that where our veterinarians must step in and must assist. So it's, it can be a combined role as well. So we often get this question when we're planning, how many animals should we plan for? How, 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 how should we be prepared? Uh, and the short answer is we don't know. Uh, you have to uh, prepare for the best uh, situation that you can uh, in terms of your resourcing and prepare for the worst in terms of what kind of disaster could happen. So the short answer is you could potentially see hundreds within hours, days, weeks, or even months. Uh, we uh, know that we will see a lot of wildlife because in Australia we have a lot of wildlife. Um, so that's one thing you can definitely prepare for. And in that case, we do want our wildlife veterinary specialised teams to step in and assist as well because of the complexities around conservation. So the most important takeaway for today is to create the system that works for your organisation and the response. Uh, in time, we hope that there will become more formalised versions for Australia. Uh, and in the meantime, this is the best option that we can take. So before we go in, we of course must be prepared. And so the protocols are probably the most important thing that you can do. Make sure that you've got pictures of what it is that you'll be looking at so that you can help to guide people. Even some of our uh, experienced veterinarians don't always see burns day in, day out. So all of us need to be able to refer to documents and standard operating procedures particularly around species ID as well. Uh, if you're deploying to a different area, you might not be familiar with that particular wildlife species. So we need to be able to see what that looks like. And again, any of the situations that you're going to encounter, you'd scenario plan for and then create some uh, SOPs around that. Triage has to in include, uh, when it comes to planning, our capacity triggers as well. So when are the points that you're going to need more human resourcing? When will you need uh, more cages and other logistical matters as well? So thinking about all of those types of things. So we have to sense make what's going on so that we can scenario plan really well with that situational awareness. Identification is a huge, uh, huge point of um, concern uh, from many different aspects, including legal risks in disasters. So we must be very careful in terms of what kind of policies we're putting uh, together for our teams and ensuring that each animal, particularly in the small animal realm, is identified as an individual. So an EJ collar, one of the little uh, sticky waterproof collars that you can put on dogs and cats will work quite well. You can also use those for rabbits. Uh, each individual must be ID'd as well as having a cage card preferably and of course all of their medical details written down on a chart preferably. For our larger animals we may, may use paint, um, you can use some sort of hardcore chalk if you like as well, there's some safe ones out there uh, and uh, just depends on the scenario as to how you will ID them but make sure that you are documenting everything that you're doing as well which leads us into admin. Um, for administration um, we want you to document everything and be prepared to go offline as well so um, using paper systems and being sure that you can uh, make uh be clear on the decisions of what you've made and why as well it's really important for our triage crews to understand how they impact the workflow of the actual response because they set the workflow for that particular shift and not just that shift for ongoing future shifts as well so um, understanding how it connects with decontamination, another important uh, function in triage and treatment, uh, how it connects with the treatment area, and of course, euthanasia, if you have time to do it. We're talking mass casualty, lots and lots of patients coming through. For our veterinary personnel, we must support our people and have really healthy um, wellness practices because of the ethically challenging situations that we face every day in our work. Disasters are only going to bring more and for us to be robust and resilient, we want to utilise those practices and the best time to practise those is peacetime every day in veterinary practice so that you're prepared for when you use them and when you're responding. 
Cultural understanding is incredibly important as well. I give the example of the recent Kimberley floods in Western Australia, um, where our teams uh, were going up north, where we have a lot of Aboriginal population. And this means that we need to work differently, working very closely with the elders, understanding what exactly the communities need. We can't tell them they need to tell us so that we can work together as a team and facilitate the needs so that we can have recovery and then resilience. I also wanna make the point of sustainability here, making sure that we are thinking about um, reducing, reusing, and of course, how we're recycling as well. Set up your bins so that you can uh, have really effective waste management. We don't want to be contributing to climate change and uh, contributing to the disasters if we can that we're actually trying to fix as well. So what are the sorts of scenarios that we might see? There's three general scenarios that triage can occur in. So we can have field triage, um, generally where we're out looking at herds of animals, so livestock. Uh, we can also have mobile veterinary unit, like the fantastic one that we just saw. Um, wow. Uh, so the mobile veterinary units are an all-in-one um, system. They've obviously got a lot more resources than a field team going out. And with our medical or veterinary hospital uh, sort of triage in that area we have got obviously quite good resourcing particularly our very big facilities so in Western Australia um, our teaching veterinary uh, hospital has got quite a lot of cage space a lot of staff on hand to help uh, even having said that we need to be aware of, of our business continuity making sure that we're linking in with other local and regional and also state level facilities so that we can share that caseload really well because once we've triaged we want to get these patients on to safer places where they can receive the level of treatment that they need. Let's get that flow happening uh, so that we can, we can have resilience there. We can have some specialised teams when it comes to triage as well, and that's because of the skill sets that they have. So wildlife, uh, veterinary emergency response teams, livestock, particularly uh, in Australia, that's handled by our Department of Agriculture, uh, different name per state and territory, of course. That's part of their jurisdiction and their planning to look after livestock. Small animals and or exotic teams, so um, little bunnies, uh, guinea pigs, and of course, dogs and cats and so on and so forth. Uh equine teams and uh, we can have combined teams in Australia as well. This is really important from a fatigue management point of view. And so there's some um, uh, examples there below. If you want more, please contact me after. I'm very happy to talk with you about it. So let's look at uh, our team and what a veterinary emergency response team would have on a, on a really good day where we're fully, fully uh, resourced properly. So we're always going to have um, a team leader. We all need that. And from a triage perspective, uh, we should have a nurse looking after each particular area of triage. Depends on how big your operation is and what exactly you're doing as to how many people you'll have and the system, of course, that you're using. So we'll have a, a triage nurse, a re-triage or reassessment nurse. Now you could have one for each area, particularly when you see the colors in a moment, um, each nurse looking after each level, you may have more than one depending on how many animals you have. If we can have nurse scribes, even better, they can document a lot of the legal uh, points for us. So what did we say? When did we say it? And what happened after that? Decontamination nurses, um, perhaps using vet nurse assistants or veterinary assistants here as well. If you're in a situation where you don't have access to a wildlife team, but you need help with the wildlife, particularly around conservation status, wildlife rehabilitators, experienced people can really uh, assist with that. Admin teams, treatment teams, of course, and body disposal and management. Unfortunately, we do see a lot of bodies in disasters. Down the bottom there, you'll see veterinary social workers. Now, these are a new occupation for Australia, and we hope to see many more in time to come. So the veterinary social workers can assist us greatly in our teams because they can help our people when processing the situation, as well as the emotional components of debriefing, but they can also assist our clients in their times of need. So this is perhaps one of the worst days of their life. They can assist them with that, and they can also refer them through to services, which works really well with our one-stop evacuation shops here. We call them one-stop shops, uh, but evacuation centres where you can go and get all of the, uh, the services. 
So before we go into the systems, we want to have a look at the groupings of animals and how we generally look at them in Australia. So from a species specific point of view, small animals and their owners, as well as horses, their owners all have generally um, high expectations of treatment. And so we're looking at them generally individually and we're trying to give them um, as best care we can with the triage system that we've got. Working animals need a special mention as well. Um, and you can see down here our state emergency service dogs. Um, this is Inca uh, and also B. And of course, uh, let's not forget the human there, Craig. Uh, these uh, working, working animals are incredibly important and we just need to give them a little bit of extra, uh, extra care because of the time, the value, the money, and of course, the incredibly important human animal bond that's associated with that as well. So we might also see horses, particularly police working horses. So the scenarios could be earthquake, could also be searches as well, because remember you might have more than one disaster or situation occurring at the time. When it comes to farm animals, there's two main ways you can look at it. We can have farm animal pets. Uh, there is a range of human animal bond uh, connections here. So you might have to um, be prepared to treat the little lamb with a collar on, a uh, little daisy. We had one called Daisy once uh, and uh, the owner wanted just, just as good a care as they would have had for a dog. So just to be prepared for that, it might need different treatment. And then from our farm animals, otherwise known as production animals, it depends on the situation. So if they're high, high quality breeding stock, the farmer is most likely going to want to do more for them. Having said that, you really need to liaise with the farmer at the time because uh, there's different types of bonds there and different values associated with that. Um, but we would generally treat our farm animals as a group and triage them slightly differently because of that. Now for our wildlife, uh, so our wildlife is triaged quite differently to the rest. Firstly, according to conservation status, because we have um, a range of different levels of conservation status in Australia. So for example, that could be endangered species or threatened. Uh, and this is also, um, we want to make sure that we're looking at full recovery and release as well. So if we can't meet that criteria, we may actually choose to euthanize on humane grounds. Sometimes we need to look at specific species within that as well because of the certain diseases that they have and how that impacts conservation as well. So this is why we do need specialist wildlife teams to assist us where possible. We have some complexities around uh, certain species as well. So I give the example of a little lorikeet. They're called rainbow lorikeets, very pretty birds um, in Australia. Unfortunately, in Western Australia, they're actually pest species, which Controversially, we have to euthanize if they do come to the vet hospital because of conservation, but they can also be a pet in Western Australia too. So we encourage our pet owners to microchip them where possible. Over east, however, and the eastern coast of Australia, these are generally adored locals, even though they're a bit loud and squawky. So um, it really, you really do need to know your species and how um, how they are uh, legally considered and, co and, and considered from a conservation point of view as well. So don't forget to bring in some extra help there if you need it. Uh, our zoos, our wildlife hospitals, rehab centres and rehabilitators all have a wealth of experience between them. They can really assist you. Now, zoo and lab animals are a different category categories again, so I will leave those for another day. Um, they usually will have their own plans because of the special nature of the work that they're doing. So let's move now into triage systems. There are many different triage systems that you can use and having a look at the human medical uh, mass casualty management in Australia, there's a plethora. So when we look at vet triage, uh, generally one of the most common systems we can use is veterinary systems, triage and rapid treatment. Now this is a four level system and you can see from the colours there, they might even be familiar to you uh, because these are very similar to what uh, human mass casualty will use as well. So we have uh, the animals that are categorised as red. These need immediate care. So these have abnormal respiration, pulse rate, and also pressure. So of course, the systems that are affected are respiratory and cardiovascular system. So as an example, we might see some animals with internal and external burns, hyper or hypothermia, smoke inhalation, and also snake envenomations in Australia. We have a lot of toxic snakes. 
So as you know, this affects the respiratory system, um, which is why it would go into an immediate, uh, immediate category. So those animals usually will go straight out to treatment area. Otherwise, if they're slightly more stable, but they still need immediate care, they will go to the red area of treatment waiting to go. They should be collected fairly quickly. In the really yellow good. category, we have abnormal uh, pulses. Uh, so that's the rate, the pressure, but we also have abnormal uh, neurological signs as well. So in this uh, situation, these patients are urgent. This means they're going to survive if treatment is received within a few hours. You might have the opportunity to give them some quick analgesia, that is pain relief, uh, to ensure that, of course, uh, they are resting as comfortably as they can. So as an example, uh, from a neurological point of view, this could be a minor toxicity, or perhaps uh, it will be a deep laceration as well, affecting pain, making the pulses go up. When we're looking at the green, this is our walking wounded. Uh, so these are normal generally with their vitals, but they may have some small issues going on. These animals uh, ideally will go to primary care, general practice as soon as possible. Uh, at, not that they need to go as soon as possible, but they need to be moved on from your area as soon as possible. Um, they can probably wait to see uh, a veterinarian, that's okay. In terms of black, now this is one of the most difficult uh, sections of triage because we have a very fine line between red and black animals, so immediate versus we are not going to, to, to treat them. When we're thinking mass casualty, many, many animals, uh, we need to focus on treating our red animals rather than our black, which are dead or dying. Because if you can imagine, you, you try to focus on your black animals that are dead and dying. By the time you've done that, because of the resourcing that you've got, you then lose all of your red animals or some. Remember, our, our mission is to save as many animals as any, any as many rather animals as we can. So the black ones, unfortunately, are dead and dying. They do need to be put into the black area. If you have resources to euthanize humanely, then you will do that. In terms of field triage, we have three different levels and these mimic the other levels as well. So red is uh, benefiting if medical treatment occurs immediately. Remember, these are usually herds of animals uh, and green will survive if uh, treated or not. And again, black, if we can euthanize, we will try and do that quickly. So here's some more complexity. When we're looking at what the Department of Agriculture does, uh, they actually have four stages to their triage. So they will, for number one, destroy immediate so this is for burns, if there's more than 15% of burns to the body, looking at those specific areas of damage. Number two, they will salvage slaughter if they can, give or take the uh, burns that they've got. Uh, for This is for cattle, to teats and udders, so they may dry them off instead and reassess them later on. Number three, um, keep and nurse. So of course, providing uh, pain relief and everything that they need, supportive care. And this of course is within less to 10 to 15% burns. Um, some of these animals may be hospitalized, particularly if they are high breeding stock as well. Uh, number four, no apparent damage. And of course that's going to be continually observed. Now, when we look at how we're doing the vitals, um, we can think, okay, well, if we're going to do respiration, pulses and neurological assessment, then there's various ways that we can do that. So more complexity in triage as well. I like to think of RAP when I'm doing um, the triage vitals. So instead of... Um, bypassing mucous membranes and capillary real full time and just a distance exam looking at respiration and then hands-on close exam doing pulses. Uh, I like to actually do um, respiration from a distance exam, thinking about alertness as well. We're automatically getting this information when we're seeing the animal, the gait, how they're behaving, uh, whether they're comatose or not. Uh, and then from there, I always do a quick mucous membranes and capillary real full time. It just gives us so much more information and then uh, perfusion parameters by doing those pulses. But again, going back to um, the RPPN, um, that, that can align quite closely if you, you remember that part. So we need kits to be able to uh, do our response really well. And so depending on what you want to do will depend on the types of kits that you're going to prepare. So for triage, uh, you can establish a basic kit, uh, then from there, a decontamination kit, really important because a lot of these animals, particularly the floodwater animals, are going to need to be washed off. 
a treatment kit, of course, and then we can go into the more specialised kits. Irrespective, irrespective, I would also recommend a safety kit, of course, as well, um, muzzles, cat muzzles, and depending on the areas that you're working, you might have guns with licences, of course, and darts as well. Okay, so in summary, uh, plan and practice and work with other stakeholders other veterinary hospitals, emergency services to achieve really quality response and triage. Use your peacetime to your advantage. It's going to help you in everyday work as well. Practice uh, leadership and moving into leadership if that's something that you're interested in. Um, practice your teamwork. Practice your pro words for radio. It is awesome being able to say Roger and not being able to have needing to have to say all of the other words, particularly in emergency and critical care where, where we are running all the time. Um, practice your briefing and debriefing. That's super important for us even normally so that we're not renew, um, ruminating on things when we go home. Our key system that we've looked at uh, is the veterinary systems triage and rapid assessment. So we call that VSTART and you can choose RAP or RPPN to assess. Establish Erica? those kits. Hi, we're so sorry to jump in on you, but we just have a couple minutes left. So if you could just kind of wrap up and if there's any additional slides, share those. Yes, absolutely. We're on the last slide now. So perfect. Time. Okay. So, so uh, establish those kits to address what your plan entails. Work with your clients and your team uh, to prepare. Uh, it's because that community engagement is so important. If every person, if every home has a plan, including your team members, um, then they're going to respond a lot better to the emergencies when they happen. In a disaster, you will absolutely go to what you know. So make sure that is your well-planned triage. Uh, and of course, your training and your plan there. Wellness is a priority for veterinary personnel. We must be prophylactic in that. It is a preventative uh, approach. Recommend that we establish national guidelines for vet disaster triage and align them internationally where possible. Note that in Australia, animal emergency management and its nomenclature is a developing area. Therefore, we are still having um, some really good conversations about the direction it, it should go, and we invite people to be a part of that. Sustainability on our incident command system is important. We shouldn't be contributing to the disasters we're trying to manage. Uh, and of course, funding and trained teams are important in the veterinary capacity for community resilience. We focus on one health and one welfare. So thank you, everyone. Uh, that concludes my, my session for today. Uh, if I can draw your attention to our Veterinary Ready Disaster Resilience Workshop that myself and psychologist veterinary and veterinary nurse Susan McLean are running, uh, our contact details are there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. I am afraid we ran out of time for uh, for discussions. I had questions, and I bet the audience also uh, was interested in having a few questions or comments to you. Uh, but we are pressed with time. I um, encourage everybody to uh, write to Erica for more uh, more of this interesting uh, logistical wealth of information. Thank you again, Erica, and thank everybody for uh, for assisting. Thank you for having me.